Okay. So um, I'm going to move on now to further beam shaping. Instead of just making spots, we're going to use our spatial light modulator to do some more interesting things, perhaps. So um, if I had a laser pointer here, laser pointer would give me a spot of light that was maybe a millimeter in diameter. Shine on the wall, it'd be probably still a millimeter. It'd have milliradian divergence. But uh, if I could park the clouds and make it completely sunny today, um, and let's say I could shine a laser onto the moon, because the divergence of that beam would be about 100 kilometers wide. And so light beam, Gaussian beam optics tells us that a light beam has a Rayleigh range given by pi times the square of the beam weights over lambda. When you tightly focus a light beam in your microscope, so a micron or so, it's got a few microns depth, right? We all know that. What if I could make a light beam that had a few microns diameter but went on for a centimeter? Ten centimeters. What if I could stop the diffraction of light? Can we do that? Well, y yes we can. We can cheat a little bit. We can't really beat diffraction, but what we can do is we can structure or pattern light to overcome um, it over a finite distance. And the Bessel beam is one of a family of beams that um, are currently being used for quite a lot of things um, that do this. So I'm not going to bombard you with a lot of maths on Bessel beams. But what I'm going to do is show you how physically how you can go away and imagine how a Bessel beam works. So the correct phrase isn't really non-diffractive, that's why I put it in speech marks, you'll hear that phrase, but really the correct phrase is propagation invariance. So it doesn't change as it propagates towards you. So that green, picture of that green beam in the top left, as it comes towards you, it doesn't get any bigger or smaller. Okay? The radial scale stays the same, the pattern stays the same. So how can that be? Well, let me give you a very simple analogy, and then I'll take you through some of that very quickly. How do I do that? Let's just say my two arms are light beams. And let's, let's say they're coherent light beams. Okay? They're going to interfere. I'm not wearing a stripy shirt today. But if they, if I were, I you can imagine my two arms, they'll be fringes. Okay? Interference fringes. The interference fringes will be given by the wavelength and the angle between my two arms. Okay? Now if I walk towards you and I don't do anything with my arms, you're not going to be too surprised that the picture of those fringes didn't change. Now imagine I was a contortionist and I could rotate my elbows in two pi. You might imagine a picture just like the one in the top left there. Now if you do that, it turns out that's exactly what a vessel beam essentially is. So as I walk towards you, that pattern doesn't change. Now you might say, well that's, that sounds interesting. Why don't we just do that? Why, why don't you just keep walking out the door and have a, a break in before dinner? Well, we don't do that because if you think of the distance between my two elbows when I'm standing here, maybe half, three quarters of a meter. As I walk towards you, think of the, project my elbows back. Think of the aperture that I need to create those conical wave vectors. As I keep walking back, now it might be a meter or two. Two meters, it's just becoming practical. So really, a vessel beam, all it is, is a set of conical wave vectors. Wave vectors on a cone. How do I do that? Do I use a lens? No, because that bends line at different angles. What I want is a conical lens, an axicon. An axicon is basically a cone that's machined into one side of a piece of glass that refracts the light all at the same angle. And that will create the beam that you see in the top left. And you can do that either with a glass element, or you can program the axicon kernel onto a spatial light modulator, or you can use a number of other methods that I don't want to go into. How do I understand this? Well, um, the Fourier transform is not surprisingly, given the area disk is a Bessel function, the J0 function is actually an annulus in K space. So it tells me there's one value of K, like a Dirac delta function on a ring. Which is, it makes sense, I don't have a spread. Look at my arms, they're just one angle, right? But one value of K around the cone, right? That makes sense, that makes sense. What's another way of thinking about this? A propagation invariant beam is a beam, any beam can be decomposed into plane waves. At any point in space, the superposition of all those plane waves tells me what the beam pattern is. 
If I then wish to propagate the beam towards you a little further, what I do is I add the appropriate phase shift, say k delta z, and then I add it all up again. It turns out that the Bessel beam is a special case where this phase occluded is exactly the same, so the pattern looks the same as it comes towards you. And if we can see that the waveform of the Bessel beam, are we able to say that plane wave is could be used for this picture of propagation? Yes, you can. You can do that. Sorry, what do you want to say? That the, the plane wave. This is a plane wave yeah, illumination. I, I mean, if we consider the wave from of the vessel of Gaussian beam propagated yeah. through the space, so it's not obvious that it's relevant to plane wave. A plane, an infinite plane wave, is also non-diffracting, as well as you'll find in the, in the in the electromagnetism. So, in fact, it is essentially a plane wave. The problem is we can't do this over a, a large enough distance because of that aperture argument I used earlier. Right. Okay? So only over the distance that I can illuminate this axicon, for example, which means in this diamond-shaped region, I have the waves coming in and are interacting on the cone. Now the problem is, the Bessel beam isn't just a, spot, a, a beam of light like this pen that comes towards you. There's the outer rings. How much power is there in the outer ring? That's the first question, John. It turns out, that power is equally distributed, more or less, in a finite vessel beam. So if I have a vessel beam with 10 rings, it's 10% of the light in the middle. That's awful, right? It's throwing away 90% of the light. Is that bad? Well, it's, it's not as bad as you might think in many applications. So bear that in mind, OK? If you want to see more on the history of this, I can give you a review paper we wrote on this. Bombardier with lots of maths on the scale, the Helmholtz equation, should you wish. Um, these are also used, you can even put a singular zero in these beams, so you can have a beam that's got a zero. If you want to do stead microscopy, people have done stead microscopy with these beams as well. You can do that. Um, and the work really goes back to Dernan and Eberly, who did some work in 1987, um, in PRL, who really coined this phrase. But I know Colin, he's not here now, but he, he's also done some work that he um, seems relevant to this area. And that, um, anyway, that's the main point of this beam. What does this beam do? I'll show you a lot in a moment on imaging, but first, for 10 years we did some silly things with optical traps. So on the right you're seeing red and white blood cell sorting with no markers attached. How is that possible? This corrugation of the vessel beam, lymphocytes and erythrocytes move differently, so the circular the spherical white cells just migrate over the optical corrugation to the middle due to the tweezers force. The red cells they get caught in the rings. So we picked just the pitch of the pattern, and that's self-sorting. There's nothing added. You just turn the beam on, go away for a cup of coffee, and the white cells migrate into the middle into a little town. Okay? It's just pretty slow, unfortunately. In the middle, you see Bessel beam turns on its side, guiding or transporting particles. This is um, an interference pattern of Bessel beams that's used to transport uh, single viruses and small particles over millimetre distances. This is cute physics. I'm not going to pull the wall over your eyes. It's not got a real big biomedical application, but it's actually very, very interesting. The size here. Which one? The size here. The this is this one? This, in these images. This one. Are different. Here is 50 microns, above is... It's yeah, so that, that's about four or five mi um, microns. And in the middle, what is the sheet? These are one micron. Um, beads, but that's actually much larger, that's like a millimetre or so. But the image is larger than 50 microns. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, on the left, you see another experiment, which, won't, which I'll maybe mention at the end when I do light sheet, which is that these beams also appear to go over obstructions, which is known as self-healing. Why do they do that? Well, if you think of this conical wave vector, if I put an object here, distorting the beam, you can see that the beam here is actually created by light that comes in on a cone. So something in front in, on the axis is actually not affecting the beam in front of it. So even though the beam looks like it's coming towards you, because the beam is continuously being replenished from the side, it appears that the beam reforms around the obstructions, and it does. And this is a very interesting property that has, uh, in fact, we have a paper accepted today using this on in uh, airy beams for uh, light sheets, which are I don't have time to tell you about because, uh, but anyway, let's uh, let's talk about airy beams as well because I like these beams too. The the airy function um, is related to defocus. It's a cubic phase mass, but this is also a light beam that is part of this non-diffracting family. Let's see this beam in action. Let's uh, let's uh, 
Yeah. There you go. So that pattern on the top left is actual simulation of this beam. So just like the vessel beam, it's a pattern that comes towards you, but it doesn't get bigger or smaller. It's a strange looking beam that seems only interesting to uh, people like myself probably. Um, but in fact, Sir Michael Berry and Balzas in 1979, in a paper in American Journal of Physics, looked at dispersion-free solutions of the Schrodinger equation. That's in non spreading And they found that the airy wave packet was one of them. It turns out the Schrodinger equation, believe it or not, has an absolute correspondence with the paraxial wave equation. And so you can transpose solutions. So a group in Creole is a special light modulator to create these beams only nine years ago. And they've exploded onto lots of things. I'll show you some examples. How do you think of that beam? Well, just think of one dimension, just a top row, okay? A big blob and lobes going off to the left, right? That's how it's created. That's the big lobe. And it's like these sticks, and they're on a they're arranged so that the core stick traces a beautiful parabola. Okay, so that is just going up the top there. Okay, that's one way of thinking about it. And you can see that little obstruction, that black S. If I block part of the beam, the beam here is reformed from these parts of the beam aperture here, just like the vessel beam. It does the same thing. How do you do it in the in the lab? You can just do it just like the acousto-optic deflector or the vessel beam. Here what I'm showing you with a spatial light modulator place the conjugate, remember the conjugate plane to the back aperture, put a cubic phase mask, image that, the objective does a Fourier transform, I get my airy beam in my sun. What did we do with this beam? So one of the things we did on that last paper, and what about now, I'll show you maybe. Here's an example. Um, so this video on the left is rather like taking us all to coffee but not going through the door going through the roof. So the airy beam collects the particles and pushes them up in a curved trajectory. So here we're moving cells between one chamber and another without touching them. All right, so the particles move on the corrugation. There's for the parabolic trajectory. We engineered the beam just to basically, we called it the optical snowblower. So it pushes particles from one chamber to another. And that's the, so that's the kind of thing it can do. Okay, that's all fine and good, but um, what, what more can we do with this? Let me now move to real complex beam shaping. So I've given you spots. I've told you how to do left, right, up, and down. I've shown you some beam patterns. Of course, we could make optical vortices this way to do stead or something like that. But one of the most exciting areas, I think, in uh, optics in the last five to 10 years has been um, complex media or disorder. So I'd like to tell you today that a sugar cube can do exactly what a lens can. They're exactly the same in my book. Okay? Now I know you're not all rushing out to swap your optics for sugar cubes, but why am I saying something that sounds utterly ridiculous? It's not ridiculous. What's, ri what's amazing is a lens, you can go to a book and you know the ABCD matrix for a lens, right? I would like to contend to you, if I ignore absorption, there's an ABCD matrix for a sugar cube. It doesn't have to be a sugar cube. It could be your bathroom window, it could be a piece of sellotape, it could be anything that scatters light. Now, you might say, well, I suppose, well, I suppose that is. Yeah, okay. But how, who, who cares? Who wants to calculate that? Nobody, right? However, if you're in biomedical optics, you might be interested in that because this need not be a sugar cube. It could be a piece of tissue. It could be a scattering medium. We're all interested in scattering media. And this is known as the area of the transmission matrix. And it's linear optics. And there's lots of papers that I can... and. Um, there's a lot I could say on this topic, but I'm going to show you how we work this out. Right? What I'd like to do, it's no use if I can't work it out, I've got to work it out. I've got to work it out quickly and easily. If I can do that, then maybe I can propagate light using my shaping, not just for trapping, but maybe for imaging or something else. Okay? All right. And we're not going to use sugar cubes, that's the last sugar cube we see. All right, now I'm going to give you the little cartoon that explains the next 30 minutes. So you can just watch this and you can understand this as well. Right? So here's a lens. It focuses light to a spot. Everybody happy with that, right? Good. That's the ray optics picture. Well, we like waves, right? So let's have wave optics, and this shows you the lambda over 2, right? And what does that mean? It means, rather like uh, Colin was saying this morning, coherence, we're adding up coherence. He's talked about focus. He missed that electron focusing light, I guess. But that's focusing light to a spot. So when light, that's really what you're doing. You're adding up waves. That's all you're really doing in optics, actually. 
Everything's interfering to landing up wave. If you add them up well, you get a beautiful spot. If, however, you have aberrations, and here, for simplicity, I put the aberrations as a distorted lens, I get a blur, blurriness here, so I'm not happy. So my light gets blurry. It's either through the optics or, or whatever it is. It doesn't matter what it is. Okay? Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to put a door in front of each of the waves. Okay? I'm going to put a door. And then I'm going to open one of the doors. <laughs> I have to synchronize this step by talk a little better. So. All right, here we go. We, all right, and then what we're going to do, there goes, there, goes, there goes the wave, and we're going to detect it on a little detector. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be a photodiode, it could be excitation from a fluorophore, it could be scattering from a nanopore, whatever you want. All I'm going to say to you is make it linear scatter, linear, okay? That's it. All we're going to measure is intensity, and we measure a signal. Now, I'm going to go to another door and just open the door. Is it a good door? That's a good door. I like that door. Okay, we'll remember that door. That's a bad door, okay? I'm going to put a post-it on that door and come back and try and ignore that, right? So now I'm going to keep doing this. It's really boring, isn't it, right? So this is it. This is what complex physics is, right? This is it. Now, you might say, why on earth am I doing this? Let me first say some things. I'm not assuming any polynomials or any fancy optics about the aberrations. What I'm doing is I'm probing my optical system in K-space in, in, in complementary information. I'm not replicating information by going through the same part of the aperture. I'm looking at a different part. All right? So each of these bits of information is important. I'm also finding out which part bits of the way help me. So all those doors are good. So I can keep the other doors closed and move on. Is that true? Well, that, I could do that. I could do that. But you know, we don't like to throw away light, do we? What would be really cool is if I could do something to the other doors to turn those waves into waves that help me, help me increase the signal. So what I do is I introduce a phase shift because I've measured an interference signal. Right? If I do that and I get the phase shift correct, I will probably burn my detector and have to go back to my supervisor and ask for a new camera or photodyne. But what I've done now is turn, is turn the wavefront into a good one. And as you can see, even this is a simple idea, without using any Zernica polynomials, say, I've got spherical aberration, I've got coma, I've got uh, whatever, pincushion, it doesn't matter. This principle applies to everything. This is fundamental, right? Fundamental. Right. Everybody got that? That's exactly what we're going to do now. That's it. Okay, so how do, how do we do this in the lab? Well, we, of course, we don't use doors. What we do is we, we, we segment, a, say, a spatial light modulator. So we've got a 512 by 512 array of liquid crystals, and I put little boxes. Each box is my door. What do I do? There we go. Uh, when I first start off, I might have some amplitude and phase. That, that's the kind of spot I get these days if I go into that and try and set up anything. Right? You get a spot like that, you go, oh, God, we'll realign it. Let's put on the grating. Remember the grating? Remember the spatial light modulator, the grating? Yeah, so I put a grating on. The grating deflects the beam into the top left into the first order. I can go into details why we use a grating. Use a grating because if you go in the first order on spatial light modulation, you can do both phase and amplitude. It allows you to miss the zeroth order beam as well, which I talk, can talk about afterwards if anybody's interested. And then we have a little phase. And then on the top left, what we're going to have is um, another door. So let's open another box. Right? And then what I'm going to do is in the top right, is it stored? No. There we go. There's my probe. Now my probe, again, is a fluorophore, a detector, can be a pixel on your camera, it can be anything you like. And what I'm going to do is in box B, I'm just going to play with the phase. Remember that red thickness? What I'm doing is I'm playing with the phase, and the only bit of maths I need is this, which every, everybody knows that equation, right? Mm -hmm. All right, two waves, add them up, get a cost, interference term. And then what I do is I do all the boxes. Now you might say, hold on, how did you pick the size of the box? And how do you know how fast it's going? Great questions. Great questions. Let me think ahead for you. All right, the size of the box. Most, mostly, you will have low frequency aberrations in your system. So you can get away with boxes that are typically 10 by 10 pixels on a 512 by 512 spatial light modulator. As I do this, I will build up a phase and amplitude profile of my beam just by recording amplitude. Why? Because it's interference. Interference is a wonderful, wonderful thing in physics. After I do this, I will know what to apply to every little box to get a perfect focus. <coughs> right? If I did this through my sugar cube, I would do the same. Just put this through a sugar cube. It's the same. 
I could do that through a sugar cube. I could do it through a lens. I could do it through anything. So I've worked out the transmission matrix for this particular system, which is a funny wiggly lens, right? But it could be anything. So if I've done that, I should be able to get the perfect focus. So this isn't um, just me or our group. There's lots of groups doing this. And in different ways, there's variations. It's a big, hot area. This is a great review paper if you want to have a look at it in, uh, from Allard Moss group. Above is an absolutely analogous idea published at the same time by Eric Betsy that we published ours for manipulation. Look at going through a mouse brain for multi-photon microscopy. And that's, uh, for example, one of the many... We heard a comment, I think, from Martin, I believe it was this morning, about adaptive optics being an important area that's, uh, or whatever it was, uh, uh, in biomedical. I can give you some more papers if you want, some more light reading for this evening um, on this. So, very exciting, very interesting. Let's just see it in action, because I don't want to just show you videos and say, oh, well, it's magic. Let me just show you some examples. So, um, that's the method there. Is that video going to work? If it's not, I'll just use it. Yes, it is. Actually, let's, let's start with this. This is it's an experiment you can do when you, if any of you, who's got a spatial remote line modulator in their lab? Right, there's oh, two of you, okay, two or three. You can even do it with a DMD. We've got a digital mi mi micro mirror device. All right, so there's a half a dozen people in the room who could go, okay, so just go home, just get your device, program it, take one camera, put a piece of sellotape in the way, and just pr program it with these boxes to focus on one pixel on your camera. Go home, have a nice day there, sleep on it, and you'll get back, and it will optimize by three orders of magnitude speckle. Or concentrate the light distance speckle. So that's like going through speckle. Now I must point out, originally, we, I, we got very excited by this, but two people who aren't in biomedical optics have done very analogous work. There's Vela Cooper Mosk in these three really uh, rather heavy papers, which I'm not going to go into detail now because it's wrong audience, but they're very beautiful. The subtleties about the algorithm they use in the method compared to what I'm showing you. But here, that's what they did. So here's examples of our first data. Uncorrected spot, corrected. Bad vessel beam, good vessel beam. It just goes on. Whatever beam you want, you can focus it down and go through scattering media. Okay? Now, other groups, specifically Genalia Farm, are using this incredibly to go to really great depths. They have um, some very sophisticated algorithms and some very, very good people pushing this at the moment. But it's a very exciting area. Let me show you the kind of thing you can do. So, on the right, you see optical trapping with 200 microwatts. So that's pretty low. Usually you need milliwatts or sort of optical power. By correcting the beam going through that objective, we could do that. You can trap through the condenser. There's lots of byproducts of this because you get the beam so absolutely perfect in the plane. Exactly where you do the experiment, you can get some beautiful um, trapping. With, so you didn't really go put any light beam to do it, laser through the condenser beam. But you can. You can use a condenser as an optical lens if you wanted to. Those are two examples of what you could do. There's a lot more to come. Uh, this is an example of going through scattering media. Um, we've gone through thin laser tissue, a few hundred microns or so with this, but this, these are just some nice videos that show the principle. So there's the beam, and I guess only people at the front of the auditorium can see the speckle pattern there on the top right. If you do the magic, spot appears, <laughs> as if I know. Okay, and this is what we've just gone through. Okay, scattering media. So you can really go through, put light through scattering media. How much you can get through depends on how many doors you can cope with, how much time you've got, etc. Spatial light modulators are slow. You can now do it so that you address with the acoustic optic device the surface of the SLM, so you're not limited by the speed of switching liquid crystals. And you can do this, you don't have to open and close doors like I did mechanically. You can do the whole thing in about 100 milliseconds. So you can do nearly on the fly correction. Okay? So that's trapping through there, but I um, want to move on to imaging for the last hour or so of my talk. Why would you want to do this? I'll just put this slide up. It's not our work. This group from China did some in vivo optical trapping of blood cells. And uh, the only reason I picked up this paper is that they cited our work saying the next step was to do exactly what we did. They tried to create thrombosis. They trapped red blood cells in a mouse vein, tried to create coagulation. Um, these are the kinds of things one might do. We've already had a little discussion of where in vivo 
optical tracking could go. So these are interesting potential future experiments one could do with this kind of idea. What I really want to come to is, instead of sugar cubes or lenses or trapping, what other disordered media could we use? And the disordered media I'd like to push to you today is a multi-mode optical fiber. So this is a fiber from Thor Labs. It supports about 400 modes. It costs about $10. It's got a numerical aperture of 0.22. Fiber optics can do much better than this. So we go to a group like Philip Russell's group at the Max Planck or or some other fiber drawing tower that'll probably make you some beautiful fibers. But I want to inform you that this multi-mode fiber carries the same information as a fiber bundle. Except that's what comes out. Now, that's not too dissimilar to what you might get if you shone light through a sugar cube. So this is my new sugar cube. This is what I'm going to correct. I'm going to correct a multi-mode optical fiber. Why is it good? It's good because it's only 125 microns in diameter instead of millimeters. If you're doing endoscopy, I think, you know, this is a lot, lot better. It can get to a lot better places. If you can so it's all about information. You can carry that information into a much smaller space. So it's a lot of exciting things you can do. So let's, let's see what you can do. You can do a lot. So that's the first picture you saw uh, when I started my talk. So we used the same idea. I'll, I don't have a laser pointer. I'll just point out some subtleties. Where's my reference door? It's here. It's a single mode fiber. Okay, so that's my reference door. And then what we do is we have three beams there. The middle beam is the reference. And then we interfere an S and a P. Why do we do that? Because we need to get both polarizations. Both parts to fully characterize the matrix. There's my multi-mode fiber. And then what we do is we characterize it at the sample plane. And then we know the matrix. If we know the matrix, then I put on holograms onto my spatial line modulator, knowing what, how the sugar cube or fiber works, to create any pattern I want. And then I can create this. Now this can now be done with GPUs very, very quickly. And we're not the only group. There's groups in Switzerland, US, um, Stanford, etc., doing this. Um, so if you want to have a look at that, this was a long time ago that we started this. Um, and I'll show you what we're going to do with it later in the moment. Right, I'm going to go on to my third lecture now. I think due to time, I'm going to skip some things. Um, I had a very nice uh, lecture on sin, but we'll skip that, which included Albert Einstein and Marilyn Monroe, that um, some of you may or may not know about. <laughs> but I think I'll just skip that. Uh, let me just say one thing before we... This, I'll put this slide up because this is a very good... Um, so I, I was going to just comment on this, especially as it came up this morning and it wasn't... Um, you can find this. This is from a seminar which I think is free. Just strongly recommend you look at. So um, you must tailor your biological problem to what you want to get on, out. So here are three examples of things that you might wish to do. Okay? Your resolution. So it's great to get excited that STEM can get down to 5 nanometers or 10 nanometers or whatever it is. But what is the price you're paying? In fact, we didn't discuss this this morning, but the way to get better resolution instead is to increase the entity of a gauss Lagerbe beam so you really squash the light. Instead, um, resolution is actually infinite. You can get as small as you want. Okay. Now, that's fine in the solid state world or in the world of nanodiamond or something, but in the biological world, you pay a price here with photo bleaching and toxicity. How long can you really afford to illuminate that sample? How deep do you want to go? Turns out an optical vortex can be unstable to propagation in turbid media. A lot of people are looking at that. Okay? So you can't just put a vortex beam in and expect that beautiful face singularity to survive as you go through depth. What's the resolution you really need for your application? And how fast you need to go? And it's great getting the beam down there, but you need to get the signal back out. Right? You forget the second half of the problem. It doesn't matter how great your beam is exciting something. If you excite one for oh, actually, I can't collect any photo of the scan. Okay, so you've got to think about these things. There's a, you've got to think of the problem in a more three-dimensional way. Okay? And you've got to think of these numbers. So put that together for your particular problem. That's all I'm saying. I'm not advocating one technology over another. And it seems, community thinks there's some methods that are hitting a sweet spot between all these parameters, which is why I personally think SIM is doing quite well at the moment, and NSIM might be interesting to look at in a little bit more detail. It hits a kind of sweet spot of ease and application. But that's 
One example, and that's why perhaps people are moving, some people are moving towards that. I'm not going to have time to talk about all the same, so I'm going to skip all these slides. It's a shame. <laughs> but if you want an extra lecture on SIM and its application to kidney disease, we can do that and on maybe a SIM. We'll go straight to uh, light sheet, I think, because I'm going to run out of time. Um, right, so I'm now going to talk about um, light sheet, which is something that we um, that is certainly interests me. I know Irina will talk about this a little bit later. So let's go back to one and two photons. I'm going to keep it very basic and first explain to you why we should be interested in light sheet as opposed to anything else. So this picture in the top from Nature shows a single and two photon excitation, which we heard about. Okay, so in single photon excitation, light comes in. Maybe um, uh, we're using a blue laser, for example, exciting GFP, green light comes out, and Colin explained beautifully this morning about the idea of a confocal pinhole, etc. Great! And then he also briefly mentioned two photon. So there we have a cascade of two photons to do the same transition. You might need to worry about the cross-section of your fluorophore. You will probably need a femtosecond laser to do that, etc. And here we have a near-infrared beam that comes in, and only at the focus do we have the right intensity to actually have a two-photon effect and get a signal out. We also get an advantage due to uh, penetration. Why is that? Because the light scattering, if we take a rally idea, goes as one over lambda to the four. So basically, an 800 nanometer photon should divide, uh, get an improvement of a factor of 16 over a 400 nanometer photon. Okay, and that's why multi photon seems to be the way to go for lots of in vivo studies. Also, they say, okay, fine. And then he showed you, for example, this picture, I, no, he didn't show you the picture, I think he just put it up, but uh, I'll just hold the pen there. There's a spot, that's fluorescein dye. There you see two photon excitation at the bottom, single photon at the top, there's two objectives, single photon at the top, multi photon at the bottom. However, what's the point I want to take you to take away? Just take away this very simple point. In both single and two photon, the gray cone permeates through the whole song. Okay? Even on the right, Though I only excite fluorophores at the focus, on the way down, I've got near-infrared photons doing something in the tissue, maybe. Well, they have to go through some of the tissue or sample, okay? That's all I want you to remember, okay? So though it might look like that's only exciting there, there is light here and beyond that point. So I'm really having to traverse parts of the sample that I really shouldn't want to illuminate before I collect light that I, I really need. So, in comes light sheet microscopy. In comes light sheet microscopy, or selective plane illumination microscopy. And it's not a new idea in terms of the geometry. Already heard Colin say something about a paper in 1940. Actually, this is a very nice review paper of the birth of what they call ultra microscopy, if you're interested, by Tina Mackers and Jürgen Pops group. And it really goes back to Zygmundi and colleagues in the 1920s when they actually looked at the equivalent geometry for light scattering from cranberry glass that allowed them to see um, and determine the size of the little particles in glass, right? Here's you know, plasmonic, you know, sort of uh, colored glass you can get. Okay, the idea is very, very simple. I'm going to show a piece of A4 paper here. Um, right, so. We just take a sheet, we want to just create a sheet of light and then just slice through the sun. Okay? And we do it orthogonally, there we are. That's an example. We can scan the beam, we can use a cylindrical lens, depending on what you want to do. And I just look at 90 degrees, okay? What's good about this? Well, you can see immediately that I'm only illuminating the parts of the sample that I really collect a signal from. Alright? That's one great thing. Okay, immediately. Let's keep it really simple. I'm now not having light, having to traverse the sample where I do not collect light from. And number two is, oh, I'm looking at the whole frame. Okay, I'm illuminating, I'm not doing this point scanning. Okay, I'm doing very much a wide field of view. And so I can do fast acquisition. Now, of course, I can either scan the sheet, I can actually scan the line, all right, I can, um, or I can move the sample. There's pros and cons depending on your application. I won't have time to go into every, every sort of um, uh, variant of this, but let's have a little look about where this can go. Um, this is actually a. Uh, if you go to Jena, 
This is actually um, the ultra microscope that they made in 1903. The truth is, nobody at that time, of course, realised these attributes of wide field co uh, image collection and phototoxicity issues, which I guess around 10, 15 years ago, a couple of groups, including uh, the Voy group and the Celsa group, particularly looked at. So that's why there's been a resurgence, and then it's been the pennies dropped, so to speak. But you can see the geometry is kind of what's been known for a while and been used. Okay. And Zygmundi, as I say, won the Nobel Prize uh, uh, for his colloid work. So anyway, that's what we have. Um, so what do we have here? We have the potential to do high contrast because I've got no light anywhere except where I'm collecting it. That's great. I'm happy with that. I don't need any pinholes necessarily or anything like that, even in single photo light sheet, to put it. Low photo bleaching. Now, many people say, so for example, uh, in our lab now, we can image things for 20, 30 hours regularly. We never did that before. Really. If you look at a lot of, one of the big problems in lots of biomedical imaging is, are you really damaging a sample? So people do viability assays, but usually they do experiment for 10 minutes, an hour, and then they don't tell you the sample died after two hours. Okay, so it's a, it's a big problem potentially. And how much phototoxicity, how much damage can we take? Well, if you read the popular media, you know how long you might be allowed to stay out in the sun. Right, that's a good way to do it, right? So, you know that if you don't put on cream and protection, you're probably not, maybe not in, uh, in the bar room, but <laughs> you know, I'm just going to San Diego, you know, you shouldn't stay out for more than 10, 15 minutes at a time, 20 minutes on a very hot day. So think about this, the uh, exposure of light that you're actually giving your biomedical sample. So there's a very nice paper in Nature Methods, which I can give you a citation for, which discusses the optimum levels of phototoxicity. But that's a very important criteria. Labs now, with light sheet, are imaging for a week. That's incredible. You can actually watch, um, and probably more, um, the, in a biological process over a long period of time and watch evolution of um, organisms. Now, I should say, this method is particularly applicable to developmental biology and neuroscience, which are two key areas where it's being applied. But there's more to come. It's, about, it's been around for 10, 15 years. There's lots of innovation coming and lots of new ideas. So it's still, surprisingly, there's still quite a young time in the field. So that's a zebrafish heart from a group at Durham in the UK. And this is an example of some photo bleaching um, in light sheets. I, I won't, we've got a lot of studies on this. This is a, a very nice, not very well-known paper by uh, Reynold and Steltzer which shows yeast cells in a light sheet, also imaged with a standard delta vision microscope. And basically, what they're showing here is that after taking a certain number of stacks in their, in their, in their, in their microscope, the delta vision just, just basically kills the sample, basically, or the yeast cells. The photo bleaching, whereas the spin can actually continue on further. So these are just indicative numbers, and you can do better with beam shaping and few more tricks, but it just shows you it's really making a very, very big impact in live imaging without any photo damage. Could you go one slide before? When you say large volumes, I can imagine that you need to illuminate from one side and then you have the detection from the other, so you're sort of in a corner for RNG. Like can, how big can your sample be? Like I, I feel if you want to do it on a very like a big sample. Okay, what, what is what is big for you? No, yeah, yeah. Okay, I can ask that question. What is big? Okay, so I would guess light sheet can typically you can get hundreds of microns by hundreds of microns by hundreds of microns at one to two micron resolution easily. That would be quite a good way to do it. But of course, the question you're asking depends on the numerical aperture and the optics that you choose to use. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not huge, but it can do quite nice large volumes very, very quickly. Okay, compared to if you, I, have, I haven't got the slides for that, for point scanning if you wanted to do that, but it would take just so long. But the, is that kind of answer your question, at least on, on size? Um, but it obviously, it's, it, it's not beating any new tricks in optics, it's just really um, the geometry and its application that make a big difference. Now there are a number of geometries you can use in light sheets which I won't go through. This is again uh, a very nice, so I'm just giving you different papers from different groups to give you a balance. Um, so this is a very nice example of how people use that for particular things like zebrafish and so on. Um, so you might have a rotating sample there and the camera looking from the top. 
That's another example there. You might fix your sample in agarose, for example. That would be great for zebrafish or something like that. Might not be so good for neuroscience, where you might use brain tissue in slices. Um, and there you might, instead of having it this way, you probably have it at 45 degrees like this, for example. There are also, I won't have time to exhaustively go through their groups, looking at single objective light sheet as well, where you come in um, from one side of the objective and collect from the other end. So there's a method by Elizabeth Hillman, for example, called SCAPE, which does that. So there's lots of variants, but the, we want to just stick to the basic principles, which is really having this kind of uh, illumination and detection at uh, a kind of 90 degree geometry. This is a very nice paper that just shows in essentially one slide why you should use it. So here, we're trying to illuminate a sample and why we shouldn't use confocal. So there you see the idea that I was trying to get across to you. We have a large slab of tissue and then we have an objective lens and we can maybe <coughs> scan a point across. In light sheet, we might have the light coming straight through like this. Here we might have a pinhole. But here, we don't really need a pinhole because we've just got light coming from that plane anyway. And we can do wide field detection. There's fantastic advantages with particularly SCMOS cameras and bit rates on, on image collection and even to do now hyperspectral imaging and multiple colors um, um, using this methodology. Um, so the frame rate can be very, very fast. It depends on your application. But SCMOS cameras are very, very quick. You can get up to hundreds of um, frames per second now. But you also need to think about, as usual, if you're doing scanning, you need to think about um, photo bleaching or damage to fluorophores. But you can get very, very fast image acquisition and also the beautiful tricks that you can see um, on the detection arm as well as the illumination arm um, for that. What pictures can you take? So these are not our pictures, that these are examples. So they are really cool movies. I think the coolest movies at the moment I've seen for a long time in biology. And so this is um, Alex Rohrbach's group for Beating Heart on the top left. In the bottom left is a paper we will discuss. This is using, you see that magic <coughs> word, Bessel? <laughs> structured, so this is using a structured illumination with a Bessel beam and also using a, a variant of that which is called lattice, which is, if you like, multiple vessels or interference patterns. And this is none of those, none of that beam shaping, but this is whole zebrafish calcium signaling um, in the hippocampus with GCAM uh, from Philip Aaron's group um, at Genalia Farm. So these are all really cool pictures. Are, are all these fluorescence? Yes, yes. Yeah. You can do a little bit of scattering. I know it's been, but I think we'll hear about that in another talk possibly. So, um, so this is the paper I just wanted to point out. This is quite a, an amazing picture. I mean, it, uh, it sort of was uh, amazing when I saw it. So here we are. Now use a second objective here. Why? Because you might have shadowing. So you know, if I have an obstruction, you might block it. So what people do is use sometimes a retroreflection or a dual objective method. Look at 90 degrees. But you can see you can get a, maybe 100 microns here with cellular resolution. This is a few years old now, there's lots of there's better pictures out there, but this is still amazing. Okay, so I won't put the numbers in now, but we can do that. Yeah, there's papers that do this. The, you, to take these pictures with standard confocal or multi-photon is very, very difficult. Very difficult and very challenging. You can see we're now getting to the point where maybe in these model organisms, we can actually um, start to understand some brain processes. Now I should say, zebrafish apparently do not get outside. They have 100,000 neurons, but they sleep, they hunt, they learn, and there's a lot of basic processes that you can learn from zebrafish. That's just one organism, and there's many others one could try um, in the system. This is a pretty incredible um, paper a few years ago. Again, this is that group, another group of Genalia Farm, Philip Kellers, and this is a Drosophila embryonic development over 20 hours. So you're going to see an embryo develop here for a Drosophila fly, really, using light sheet. So this is the kind of thing that could not be done, and I've, I've certainly never seen it in standard confocal or multifocal. So this is the kind of thing the light sheet is opening up. Um, so the, the videos, you just take any light sheet paper in a big journal and the videos will be amazing. Just click on those. Absolutely stunning. So that, I hope you agree, that is an incredible video to see. And you can see it's done with um, 
Uh, of course, I do, I'm, I'm, I've, I've highlighted the, the, the hard disk size that you need to do with, which is quite high. Um, but you can see it's pretty incredible what you can learn. All right, for these, yeah? So, so, so if this is a kind of experiment where you, you, you stay long, there's no photo bleaching and so on, why, why do you need a Bessel beam? Because you can, you can do the, uh, I'm sure you know what you're doing positive is the cover filtering. You shift the focus and scan it back and forward. Why do you need a Bessel beam to see? Yeah, okay, so why do we need Bessel or Lattice or Airy or anything like that? Okay, so why, why are we doing it? Why is Eric Metzig's group doing it? So, the, there are a number of reasons. There are a number of reasons. It, sometimes it's, it's, it's a little bit can be a bit impractical to scan over that distance without having aberrations. The vessel. Well, well, I'm going to come on to that in the next part of my talk. Yeah. But the, the beam shaping gives you a bigger field of view. So for this, this is okay, right? So maybe we have two, three hundred. I'm not sure what the resolution is off here without looking up that in the paper. But if you want that, the highest resolution with the biggest field of view at the moment, beam shaping offers that. So people do agree that Bessel lattice or Airy seems to give that for the larger um, systems. It also offers lower phototoxicity potentially. So you're right, you don't have to use them. You can go away and make a standard light sheet, to scan it with a lens and get some great data. There's no problem with that. It's not a criticism. However, as, as you'll see, the Airy beam and the Bessel also give you better depth penetration with, um, um, due to their self-healing. Which we've tried to can I can talk for another 30 minutes on that in our recent paper if you want to. So there are little advantages. We're just trying to push this so that we can take a larger organism and get the same resolution, for example. There's another question. Um, you said that one of the advantages here is that you only have light in the area that you actually collect from as well. Yes. So, um, I, well, well, compared to multiphoton, for example, where you have light going through even though it doesn't excite. Correct. Um, but if you use an airy or a vessel beam, then you said yourself that only a yeah. slight percentage of it. Yeah. I will answer these questions okay. in the coming slides. So I'll answer every single point you've just said. So I will explain how the lobes in the vessel beam and the airy beam are compensated or not, and the pros and cons. All right? So excellent questions, both of them, but they will be answered in, in the next uh, 10, 15 slides, okay? All right, I just want to show you you can do some very, very uh, exciting things with this. Um, and now I'm going to go on to exactly what you just said. So, how do I make this go even further? Well, how do I even reduce the phototoxicity more? And basically, what I want to do is create a beam of light that's like this piece of paper. Can I do that? I suppose I could scan a beam, or I could use some lens scanning system, perhaps. But what I would really like to do is just shine light onto a system um, that would give... And so. But let's go back to the Gaussian beam. The Gaussian beam has a field of view, and my axial slicing is dictated by the Rayleigh range. Pi times the square of the beam waist over lambda. So as I focus light down, you can see that's kind of the field of view of where I'd have, say, one or two microns, or whatever that turns out to be. I could use a lower NA, and then get a big light sheet like the one on the left, but it's, it's pretty thick. So I'm kind of averaging over that slice, and so I'm not really getting that resolution that I want. What I really want, is a beam that's thin as that, but as wide as that. Okay? And that's why um, ourselves, Janelia, and a few other groups are doing what we're doing. So let's see where this goes. Um, just uh, an example of why you might want to do one and two photons. This is um, another group in France doing single and two photon, but here they're looking at neural activity in a zebrafish. So sometimes you might want to do one or two photons. There are pros and cons to this. Single photon light sheet, for example, they found can stimulate photoreceptors. So there are pros and cons in these organisms to using single versus multi-photon. All right? So that's another thing to bear in mind as we look ahead as to why you might want to use multi-photon in addition to the penetration arguments. So that's another very nice paper a few years back I just wanted to point out. There's lots I could do. Right, so let's start with the Bessel beam. So let's just go answer directly head on your question. And let me now give you some more interesting details. Right, so the Bessel beam, why, why do people use the Bessel beam? Several groups do, okay, still do, and they're still doing quite a lot. So let's have a think about that. So you remember the conical wave vectors in the top left, the power is distributed amongst all the rings, but we have a central maximum that seems to not spread. So it gives you a few microns over quite a long distance. 
This is an experiment we did in our lab uh, eight years ago, and you see, you can redefine fundamentals of microscopy. Here you have fluorescein dye, and you have single photon excitation at 405 at the top, you have multi-photon from a Gaussian beam at the bottom, and in the middle you have a Bessel beam. So first thing you say is, well, hold on a minute, that's wrong. What happened to all those rings in the Bessel beam? On the left you see all the rings, but on the right you see this perfect line of light. Right? You see that? Why is that? Well, let's have a little think more deeply about what a structured light beam does in microscopy. You can see, if I look at each of the rings, so rings 0, 1, 2, denote the central maximum, the first ring and the second ring of the Bessel beam, you can see in that table, that's the exact calculation of the peak intensity that we might get. So you find out, if you look at, for example, an SHG or a multi-photon signal in the Bessel beam, the first ring contributes 2.6% compared to the central maximum. If you look at the power density. So, that's why the outer rings contribute essentially nothing to that sample. However, you're now going to say, but Kishan, you just said, but those light lights still in the sample. Right? It is. So we're going to see how we get rid of that in a moment. Okay? So we've won a little bit by having a long line of light, and it doesn't take genius now to work out. We just scan that line and we get a presto, an amazing, potentially a light sheet. That's great. Look please also at the first column where we have that the first ring of the Bessel beam contributes 16% to the excitation. So we cannot use this idea of single photon light sheet. Easily. Easily. Okay? Right. So now let's address, because um, this, is, this is all a little bit tricky to understand from the literature, what you can do. So in fact in 2008 I put in a grant for this and I got the grant, but by the time I'd actually set it up, uh, Eric Betzig had already done it. So here is Bessel beam live field. Single uh, light sheet. Anyway, beautiful paper in Nature Methods there in 2011. Okay, there's some of the other groups doing this. So Alex Rohrbach's groups doing it. So what do other groups do? Let me just because I, I won't have time to summarise everybody's approach to getting around this. So Alex Rohrbach's group, what they do is they take the central maximum. You've got the outer rings, and they do a confocal image just of the central maximum. Okay, but as you rightly pointed out, you've got the outer rings that are still permeating the sample. Is that a good way of doing it? We don't know. Okay, uh, Pablo uh, Alvarez's group at ICFO in Barcelona, they also, they don't do a confocal line scan, they just use a multi-photon beam like there, but as you rightly point out, the conical wave vectors of the beam are still permeating through the sample, so that's interesting. So Betsy realised this, so let's see what he saw, how they solved it, and they solved it with this paper um, in December 2015. Okay, as an example, I won't go through all of it, but... Um, there's the PSF, so there's a normal beam, there's the Bessel, remember the ring? Okay, in K space, there's my Bessel beam, and then they also, what they did was they took points around here and they created a lattice. So what does that mean? It means essentially, if you put two Bessel beams like this next to each other, you can pick a magic period, for example, that suppresses the lobes to a large extent. So like my fingers now the center, Central maximum, all those Bessel beams in between, those loads are mostly suppressed, and then I either jiggle these, my fingers like this, and I create a sheet. Okay? That's the way you can do it. Okay? And that's a quote from him last year, um, saying that light sheets should do better than his Nobel Prize. We'll wait to see what happens. Okay? So they're pushing that very, very hard. Okay, so now I'm going to show you a different way of doing um, single photon light sheet that offers equivalent phototoxicity, but it's an order of magnitude more easy to use than the lattice light sheet. This is for single photon. All right, so for him, single photon or multi-photon, they use this periodic array of Bessel beams. And it's a great, it does solve it, there's no question, but it's, it's complex. It's hard enough for people, I think, to make one Bessel beam, let alone arrays at the moment. So I'm going to show you how this very strange airy beam uh, does just as well without worrying about the side loads at all. So if we look at the modulation transfer function, so um, I think um, uh, for the, we, I think Colin talked a little bit about OTFs and MTFs this morning. I'm going to assume everybody's kind of uh, a little bit au fait with this. So what we've realized, it tells you basically passing spatial frequencies. So the spatial frequencies through a given numerical aperture is given by 2NA over lambda. That gives my range of spatial frequencies. And my modulation transfer function essentially tells me how well those frequencies are preserved as my light passes through an optical system. Right? Now typically we might have 
something like on the left where the MTF does drop down. We'd ideally like to have it as a beautiful straight line. It's not going to happen. And normally, I've just drawn the aberrations here in the lens, normally there's something horrible in your optical system so the MTF's got zeros and this kind of thing going on in it. Okay? That's, that's the case. So now, what we're going to try and do is have a look at this, the so Gaussian beam. So, so this is a, a simulation and a direct comparison between a Gaussian Bessel single photon, single photon, please remember that, okay, and an airy beam in the same system. Um, I've also got a lot of phototoxicity data, but I'm just going to run out of time to show you that. So here we have a narrow field of view, and there's a wide one. So here is the, here's um, how good physicists are, fluorescent beads and aqueous. And so we get field of view, maybe 10 or 20 microns in this particular instance. It's all done through the same optics for a fair comparison. What about Bessel? Bessel does a little better, but remember it was 16% of the first ring was added. So you can see it's now starting to give me a little bit better field of view, but I start to see a blurring. Okay, I start to see a blurring from those outer rings as I go further away. Not surprising. And that's why Betzig again uses this kind of pattern, okay, which suppresses to a great extent the side lens. But you have to get the periodicity right, which is well, and how that survives in scattering media, I'm not, uh, um, not going to comment on. I should say I put up two numbers there next to Bessel. You say, well, hold on, what's that mean? Ten and five. Well, a perfect Bessel beam would describe a Dirac delta function in K space. But you don't have that, right? I have a spread. So it's rather like my arms moving a little bit, okay? So the, the ring will have a finite width. And that finite width, the number ten and five, tells me the radius of the annulus compared to its Okay, so Bessel 5, for example, is a Bessel beam that's a thinner annulus in K-space. That's all it is. It's just a ratio of the radius to the thickness. And as you can see, that gives me um, a little bit better, maybe, but still very, very blurry. I've already mentioned the airy beam, and now um, I'm not going to go into the very, very um, exciting thing about the airy beam is all the lobes contribute naturally to the image formation. They are not wasting light in contrast to Bessel beam. That's due to the asymmetry. I'm not going to go through the mathematical derivation. It's in our paper. But that's the main take-home message. So here, this asymmetric pattern, actually, actually, if you like, these lobes contribute to the final image that you create. They are not wasted in terms of like the Bessel beam, which has a symmetry. What does this beam look like? We've already seen it. And this is the beam here. It's just distributing the power equally. And if you do the OTF in this asymmetric thing, you find it has a real and imaginary part, but the exciting thing is that it goes to zero at different times. So some part of the beam always contributes to the image formation. So we can measure all the spatial frequencies. Now, if you believe this, no, I hope you do, because we've done so many papers on this now. Um, that's what happens. So the MTF at focus, the Gaussian width over the vessel and airy, but anywhere else you get something like this where the area is just about better than the Bessel or the Gaussian. So this is the bizarre way to make light sheet in our lab. So we have an airy beam. Now this is a 2D airy beam because we have 2D optics, right? We have a 2D aperture. You only need an airy beam in one dimension, so what we do is we scan out one of the dimensions here. So we use either a spatial light modulator, we use also phase masks. We have also a paper showing how you can make this an open sphere if you want to. You can go home and make this in your lab. In a month we have several groups who have already done this. And so we scan the one direction out, and there we have all those side lobes. And that's the comet-like tail pattern that you get. But I want to instill in you again that when you do, and you do need deconvolution here, because we don't have a simple image to reconstruct, um, all, of that, all of that fluorescence, for example, will contribute to my image. So it's not lost information or, or lost excitation. So how do you do this? Well, I'll leave the detail, but this is an exact comparison between the three. So those are the Gaussian, that's the Bessel, and that's the airy there. Okay, so that's Agaros. So we're quite pleased with that. A single photon, it gave us a factor of about 10 over the, um, the Gaussian beam. Um, that's not what I wanted to see next. Oops, hold on, maybe I've... Uh 
sorry. Apologies, I will. So what you are saying is that the Gaussian prevents high resolution. I'm referring to the nice smooth wings of the Gaussian, which otherwise in the LED you have other wings. Which well, in the Gaussian, you get a divergence, so the resolution will just be blurred out, unless you do something like you've described, which I, I can scan it one millimeter or something. Right, so I think that's what you were suggesting. Is that correct? You have some kind of electro-tunable lens, and you scan it along the axis as well? No, I, I was after your justification behind the statement that the Gaussian destroys the resolution. Well, the Gaussian only destroys the resolution because it's just, it's just the... When I focus the beam down, it's, it's high times omega squared over lambda, but it's blurred here, it's just thick, so there's no way I can get an image of a bead if the thickness of my light sheet here is three times the thickness here, or whatever it is here. So if you keep going, then we now go to your airy beams. Yeah. What is happening in the airy beams to put that back? Well, the airy beam doesn't change. It's absolutely the same. All it does is does a curved trajectory, but the thickness of the beam stays absolutely the same over the whole field of view. And it has side loads. The, the vessel does the same. So the whole point is that beam comes towards you, like I was saying. It doesn't get any bigger or smaller. That's why that's why vessel lattice and these, these beams are, are kind of interesting. So here's an example in the lab. Um, some stuff we've done. This is, well, you can see the nice pictures. I won't... I won't go through every single picture. This was nice because we solved, um, there was a, a little creature that lives in St. Andrews in the water and uh, one of the guys in our marine lab wanted to look at this muscular structure. So we could resolve this for the first time for him. That. So that was quite a nice little study for him. Um, on the left you see cell spheroids, which is rather like cancer cell fate mapping, um, which is where you, you can map, you map and look at the uh, propagation of uh, cancer in, in these little... Um, cell biopsy models. Um, I have a lot of pictures I could just bore you with for hours, but this is an ex example of... So on the left would be what the kind of thing Philip Aaron saw in 2013, yeah? yeah maybe uh, you're talking a lot about the illumination beam. Yeah. Uh, so the detection optics and uh, yeah. the, uh, the focus parameters for that are also important, so maybe this Parking answers right. uh, Adrian's question. Yeah, it does. So, okay, so there's another thing about how quickly we can do the detection as well. So that can depend on how you scan the beam or the sample. Also, the ICFO group have used, a <laughs> coincidentally, a cubic face mask in the detection arm just recently. So last year they have a paper showing you get a huge number of volumes per second using exactly the area principle on the detection arm. So we were going to do something like that, but they beat us to it. It's great though. It's, so that's one example of how you can do it. So, you're right, this maybe leads to Adrian's question as well. This is the illumination, but there's also stuff you can do on the detection arm, which is still to be explored. But that is, that is coming out in the literature now as well. So that's what the Pablo Lewis is reading. But if you combine the yeah. uh, illumination and the detection arm, presumably you get the convolution of the two. Yeah. Is that right? That would be harder mathematically to make sure you get the correct image. We're looking at that at the moment, but it can be done. But that would potentially reduce the phototoxicity really low and give, allow you to have really very fast imaging on, on these kinds of samples. So, yeah, it's still, it's still, this is all relatively last two or three years' work. So it's still a lot that one could do here, and there's still a little bit of space. I can, sh I can share some more, even more exciting ideas. We've now actually managed to get down to over 500 microns without aberration correction, using a <coughs> new form of ARB. But uh, I know I'm going to run out of time. <laughs> so, uh, yes, but great point. So just for everybody's... Um, just so that everybody understands what we're talking about, if you're not sure, let me just go back. If I just stick, oops. If I just stick here, at the moment, what we've done is just looked at this part of the, the solution to get a wide field of view. But as Martin is uh, saying, we've not looked at how I might do any beam shaping or defocus or any tricks on this arm to improve my speed of acquisition yet, but um, the ICFO group have, have done a little bit on that. So there's still scope to make this even better, okay? But it's, it's interesting, it's an interesting time using more beam shaping um, to do this. So let's, uh, let's get more to To surprise you even further, perhaps, in the remaining Forty-five minutes. Really? Oh, right. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>
Está exciting, man. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll, I'll just continue then, and uh, so... Can you tell us about Mary Lee Monroe? You got that one and drink the bars. Okay, well, if, if, I, if I finish and you want to, I can do quickly a thing on the sim as well at the end. I'll just skip that because I thought I was going to run out of time. But we can go back to... That's on sim, by the way. That's on spatial frequencies and to help students on. So I can go back to that at the end, okay? How about I'll do that at the end. I just wanted to show you, if you wanted to, you can go, go home and make one of these beams. An area beam can be created just by tilting a cylindrical lens. So we designed this as an open spin project. Some of you will know you can actually make uh, light sheet microscopes in your lab. Um, so we've done quite a lot of work on that. This, these are just graphs showing actually that the alpha is the propagation parameter for the airy beam and that it doesn't vary too much with color. And that's an airy beam that we've created in the lab using a cylindrical. So this was done as a master's project. Okay, so you do not need to spend a quarter of a million pounds on these microscopes to get this kind of new, new, new toys. This doesn't work quite as well as one with the SLM, obviously, but it's a pretty good step, and you can buy face masks as well if you wanted to, to do that. So recently, we've, this is not with the Airy, but we've also re-engineered this uh, open <coughs> sphere um, to work for neuroscience. So these are pictures. Um, so we're taking a different philosophy to a lot of microscopists. We're going to bring the light sheet to you. We now have a suite of light sheet microscopes that are the size of A4 sheets with airy beam, scanning, and a few other little tricks. And what they do, the reason why are we doing that? So, A, the cost, <laughs> number one, but B, we cannot do all the biology and biomedical problems in our lab, even though I think St. is a fantastic place to visit and live. We can't expect everybody to come to our lab. However, we also have a lot of colleagues who work in biomedical labs around the world who also have licenses and all the protocols to do far more advanced biology than we could ever could. So if we can plant the microscope there, then we can do great things. This is an example of a microscope that we placed in Oxford. Oxford, the University of Oxford has more biologists than the whole of Scotland. <laughs> now, I would love to get all those guys to come up and use my microscope, so instead I just took it down there and now Nigel M. Titch, who's an expert in plasticity and synapse studies, has actually devoted a whole lab to our light sheet microscope and biologists come in and just do stuff. And he's done all the protocols, so it's great for us. And so somebody from our lab just goes down and checks it or upgrades it, etc. And they just keep churning out data. So it's fantastic. So it's a good way to think about how to do biomedical science for us anyway especially being in St Andrews, and we think this is, this is proving reasonably productive. So this is one example of what we did. We converted this, and we've done lots of things, including photoactivation, photo uncaging of compounds for optogenetics, and here's some pictures. And um, many people have seen this say it's already comparable to what people can get with, for example, commercial light sheet microscopes, but for a fraction of the price. OK, back to... Um, let me try and bring it around, uh, so the, the sugar cube, you haven't forgotten the sugar cube idea. I'm not going to talk about sugar cubes, I'm going to go back to the fibre. So what we'd really like to do is see where the fibre might come into this. So um, I, you've already seen what the fibre does. So a few years ago, instead of doing the trapping, you can also do more things with the optical fibre, multi-mode fibre, you can turn it into an endoscope. This is a paper I did with Thomas uh, Sismar, who's now got his own position, um, a few years ago. And the idea is that if we know the transmission matrix of the fiber, I can use the multi-mode fiber as an endoscope. It's got a small NA, I agree, but it's 100 microns in diameter. So here what we did was we, it's, it looks a bit, com it is complicated. Um, we used a laser <laughs> to calibrate the fiber and then we used um, so in other words, calibrate means basically work out the transmission matrix and then what we did was we then reset light back knowing which, which parts of the SLM to create, which hologram to create a spot anywhere and then we synchronize that with a camera to collect an image. This is actually an old image, but you can see that through the fiber we can start to get information that we want. This is actually very, very exciting and multi-mode waveguides for imaging is now growth at... You got a question? Yeah, I've got a question. Sure. Um, <laughs> Um, I just want to ask, if, if I move a multi-mode fiber, you yes, the sure. speckles move quite Yeah, no, okay, yeah, okay, I can answer that, that's fine, yeah. Terrific question. So that has been solved in the literature. Okay. Uh, so, 
So that would be solved a number of ways. So one is that you can actually, okay, so over a small field of view, you can use something called the memory effect that Isaac Freund and colleagues solved in 1995, which means that if you do small perturbations, 10 microns or so, which isn't much, I agree, of the fiber, you can still use Fourier optics and correct because the change in the mode pattern is very, very small. Number two is people have used um, DMD and fast optics, including the AOD and the SLM, which means you can recalibrate the transmission matrix in milliseconds. 100 milliseconds, so you could do that. And the third thing which has just appeared, there were two papers in Nature Photonics last year, which is people looked at subsets of modes that are invariant to bending. It's a circularly symmetric mode, so if you don't use all the modes of the multi-mode fiber, but use a subset of them, what happens is even through quite a reasonable bending, they, they still get that. Now I agree that does mean that you might not have access to all the modes that you want for absolutely every beam shaping, but it does solve that problem. So those are the three answers to that question. But all, all three solutions are in fact uh, versions of sparse imaging. Yes or no? <laughs> um, <laughs> sparse imaging. Uh, okay, depends what you mean by sparse imaging, I guess. Then. It's like with your opening the doors. You open this, close the other one, so at any one time you can use only one photo detector in that. The whole intensity, you don't need to map it on the CMOS. So you use a, a single photo detector and then illuminate it with randomly illuminated pattern coming from the multiple fiber. Mm -hmm. That's part. Yeah, I guess that's if, if that. If, okay, yes, you could look at it that way. So yes, we illuminate with a pattern and we can calibrate it. What I'm saying is that you might not need to recalibrate it if you use this subset of mode. But yes, all the first two solutions are just really recalibration. But I think that's the difference, isn't it? That in sparsity, they don't, as far as I know, calibrate it. Is that right? They know the pattern. They do know the pattern? They, they do know the pattern. You don't know the pattern because you're going through, you're either going through a fiber that you don't know, the fiber changes, the temperature changes, and you might be doing it inside the body. So at the moment, people are looking at this from obviously neuroscience and other things, which means you've got to. What people have also done is put a little. Uh, fiducial marker on the end of the fiber, which acts like a little calibration point. So in other words, they can correct it in situ from that before they uh, do any science. So they, these are all, um, there's, there's, certain, there's quite a lot of groups using this, so it's, it is pretty exciting. So one of the things we did at the time, but we never quite followed up until very recently, was we didn't just make spots or image, uh, we created optical vortex beams and vessel beams at the end of the multi-mode fiber. Right, so this is, um, for example, in the top you see what's known as a bottle beam, which, does anybody know what I mean by bottle beam? Great, okay, so that's great. So um, a bottle beam is rather like a beam that's like my two hands. Imagine my hands are light and it's dark in the middle. So you know a vortex. Now imagine a vortex beam that turns, sorry, it's vortex, so imagine a solid beam that turns into a vortex that turns into a solid beam. Be like my hands with this, something like that, right? So it's a bottle. It, it encapsulates a dark region. How do you do that? That's actually really easy. In fact, if you interfere two Laguerre Gaussian beams, the Laguerre Gaussian beams, a transverse modal basis set with indices L and P, just like N and M for modes, if you use an L equals zero and a P equals zero, a TM00 mode and a P equals two mode, the Goy phase difference, the 2P plus L plus one term, and the propagation constant means the beam will do this, it'll go a bit solid again. So turn into this. Why do you want to do that? We didn't talk about it this morning, but people want to do stead and get the stead effect in the axial direction. So Martin Booth was mentioned this morning, I believe he's doing that. He's got some papers, but there's that beam there anyway in the top left for you. Can you get the same if you move the axicon laterally through the beam? So all that pattern comes up from a misaligned axicon. Sorry? No, there's no, there's no misline. No, this is the vortex. Yeah, well, this is what I'm saying is that instead of these complications, which perhaps, perhaps I haven't understood it well, I would say that that pattern, you could get it from an axicon. Sorry, the top one? No, no, no. The last two rows. These? Yeah. If you move the axicon laterally through the beam, that's what you get. You move the axis. Oh, you mean mid displaces? Yeah, yeah. Okay, it does look like that. They're very similar. But this is, okay, might not be obvious here, but. This is actually an interference pattern between this beam and a reference beam, just to show the azimuthal phase. Okay, you're right, it does look exactly like you just said, a little bit like a displaced axicon. 
but it, the propagation will be different. So in this, from that. So this is what I'm talking about is this being here. It encapsulates light, or be like a dark region for the stead idea in the spot. Now, I should point out you can make a razor bottle beads using axicons as well, but that's that's maybe too much information for today. But I wanted to just point that out. Um, and the reason we did this is because I put that picture up there. The K, you can find modes and actually find out that the, the K vector along the propagation axis in the fiber is actually concerned. Now, what does this all mean? Well, light sheet microscopy should go inside the body, right? Low phototoxicity um, should go into different scenarios. So there are a couple of papers. So this is Christoph Engelbrecht's paper and there's some other references there from other groups. So here, what they've done is use a grid lens system to create a light sheet microscope that could be used, well you can see it's pretty simple, right? So it's engineering. So there's no, there's no, new, there's no beam shaping here, there's no clever optics particularly. So I'm not being them into service. It's a nice paper, it's a great paper, but it's just an idea of how light sheet could go into maybe inside the body or it could go into other geometries. Alright, so you can see here they've got grid lens excitation and then a collection arm here just mapped onto a camera. So this is very exciting. So what we, what we did um, at the end of last year was we created a multi-mode fiber light sheet. So this is now an ultra-thin light sheet that uses a fiber that's 125 microns in diameter. So here we've just used a normal objective and fiber for the collection, but on the top arm, we used our correction to actually create um, a scanned vessel or Gaussian light sheet as you want. So this means you could have an ultra thin small light sheet that could potentially go into animal studies or go into difficult um, geometries or situations where you might not want to uh, put a normal microscope. Hi. So for this green lens that you used in the system. And we didn't use the green lens, it was the other group, sorry. Yeah. No, the green is slightly. Yeah, okay, well, I'll, stop, I'll, stop, I'll stop the video. So how critical is motion or vibration? Ah, the answer is I don't know. They didn't do any in vivo study. It's ex vivo. And this was just done by the Engelbrecht group. So I, I, I don't know. that They may have put a number of that in the paper. But, but as you know, Monarchia and others are making confocal microscopes, etc. that go this one here. So this is not, this was not done by us. It's done by the... No, was the government experience to work with the green. Yeah. It's, uh, it's any, any little vibrations immediately okay. you know, reflected on the face. Okay, well, that's fine. We've, we've not made this, this system, so I, don't, I can't comment on the stability. Um, all I'm saying is that this, this, it, there's interest in creating ultra compact fiber based light sheet. Um, how stable this is in vivo, I don't know. This was all done um, basically on, um, on tissues ex vivo, but um, it might be quite interesting then for you to to have a look at that if you think green lenses are unstable. I won't go into how we synthesize all the hologram, I'll just show you some movies. So that's really the output of the fiber, it's a line of light that goes up and down. Okay, on a multi-mode fiber. So that's an example of a Gaussian or, now due to symmetry, it's actually easier to make the structured lattice on this than the airy beam, but that's, that's a little technicality. But you can see the resolution we can get. So this is for the first time a structured lattice like beam geometry at the end of a multi-mode fiber. So you can see we're getting some interesting results. And if, but again, like you pointed out, the flexing of the movement of the fiber might be an issue if we did this in vivo. But it starts to pave the way for real um, endoscopy and uh, microscopy inside uh, maybe living organisms. Okay, I'm, if people want to, I can go back to Sim. If you want to just take a break, I'm completely happy with that. I can answer questions. We'll have a break before dinner. Do we have some more questions uh, straight away now? Yeah. What are your next plans? <gasps> I can't tell you. That's, uh, that's top secret. I can't get okay. <laughs> okay, what do we have? Okay, so we have a, a, we have a new light sheet. So we've just done a study that's coming out in a week or two that shows the airy beam goes even deeper in neuron tissue than uh, the Gaussian beam. So we're doing more detailed studies on that. We have a new airy beam that goes even further in tissue without aberration correction. We love aberration correction, but it's complicated. It's kind of the cute thing a lot of physicists will do, 
or if you've got resources at Janalia Farm, you might do it, but you won't do it. We want to do things that every lab in the world could do. So we're very conscious that we want to trim down this technology and make sure every lab can have one of these microscopes in five years. So we're working on a new area beam that already goes deeper into tissue and you can, with a little slider on a computer, you can actually get different resolution at different parts of the, the sample. So that's, that's what we're working on. And we've also generated a new optical trap with LightSheet. So you never have to use agarose for fixing the sample. And so we can see live swimming organisms inside the optical trap and do light sheet at the same time. And so you can add drugs without having agarose fixing, for example. So those are just some of the examples that we're trying to do. How do you keep them in location if they're not, if they're not an agarose? With an optical trap. So, so the light... So you'll be, yeah, so we've yeah, actually I've got, I've got a video of that if you want to see. It's just a wrongly tumbling... Uh, okay. Um, but then you have to do the imaging pretty quickly as well. Matthias has a question. Uh, what kind of light sources do you use in these microscopes? Yeah, so, okay, so uh, for the light sheet, we just use a standard, uh, is it Vortran or something, or Vortex, what's it called? 488 laser for excitation or 561. There's nothing fancy about the light sheet uh, lasers that we use. You just need, might need a little more power if you're going to use a spatial light modulator because you'll probably get 50% loss, so you might need more than might need a couple of hundred milliwatts, but there's nothing fancy about the light sources we use for any of this, uh, particularly there's no electric thing. Okay, I know a couple of people want to see, oh, Kushi has a question. Um, if you use a multi-mode fiber, since it's so small, it may be good for small animal studies. However, if you want to use for endoscopy in humans, do you think this small field of view um, poses challenges to make some diagnostics? Yeah, so again, it goes back to the problem that you want, but we're thinking, you know, even if you want to do cranial surgery or, you know, it could get into inaccessible places just due to its physical size. But it does still, it gives you MA.22, which is still, I think, very reasonable. It'll give you a reasonable field of view, but it depends on your application. It may be too small and you may really need a fiber bundle to get there. But I'm sure it will find application. There's even um, other things. For example, we've even done some physics things where we put these fibers into vacuum chambers, for example or other hostile environments where you don't have great optical access. That's really what we're looking at. So it's not necessarily all in the biomedical arena. But yeah, it's true. It's, uh, it's not going to solve everything, or, but it's, it's, a good, it's a good way to start thinking about where uh, maybe in the future ultra thin end could go. Adrian. I, I, find, I find that analogy with the, with the plane wave as a result of uh, Bessel creation counterproductive because that there is this you said that you can generate a very nice light sheet with tilting the cylindrical lens so so for me what you do there you create aberrations mm. and that is in line with there is a recent paper from Bopas group where they they try to avoid this to extend the depth of focus and also using uh, I think it's a multi-mode fiber and they create aberrations so by introducing more aberrations they extend the depth of focus so so for but me, that's because they deliberately engineer it to have this special yeah. profile that turns out like Docho knew about this cubic phase mm -hmm. term in 95 when he used extended depth of focus in a cubic phase mask. So it is known. So yeah, I mean even even Colin said today defocus is a good way to do things in optics. So yes, you could argue it's all known, but it has to be applied yeah, to the right I'm problem. saying that it's not. I'm saying but that it's more to do is creating more aberrations because in fact yeah, well, a better okay. beam is an aberrated beam. But you are saying that it's a plane yeah, okay. wave. It's, it's a controlled aberration, right? So I've, I've deliberately uh, singled out one kind of one kind of term. But yeah, yeah, an airy beam and a vessel beam can be certainly airy beam can be seen as a as an aberration, doesn't it? No. The axicon generates uh, yeah. aberration. Yeah, that's right. So it, it does that. And it's 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 really been known. McLeod used axicons in the 1950s when they were punching holes in metal manufacturing with the analyst because it could be, it efficiently converts a Gaussian beam to a beautiful thin ray. Nobody looked in the near field where you have this vessel solution. But at the same time, you are right. You can still say, ah, oh, because it propagates so long. Yes. It's like a plain wave. Yes, that's right. Aberration free. Yeah. So that's kind of how you, how you do it. So it's just a little bit semantic, but I take your point. But the main point is tailoring it to the application that you want. All right. I think several of us want to know how Marlon Monroe would explain <laughs> SIM. So. <laughs> <laughs>
If he's a woman of many talents, I guess. I don't know. Uh, let me see what I can. Um, okay, I'll just get. So this is just a, it's a more lower level uh, part because it's not, there's no, we have got some results on sim for uh, kidney disease, but um, there's no. It really sounds like you don't want to talk about it. Oh, no, I do. I do. I'm very happy to do it. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's go. Right, so. Super resolution. So I'm now just going to, and I, I Colin talked a little bit about SIM. So we've heard about all these techniques today. So um, this, this is a really cool video. So it's not, this is Benjamin Chen's work um, in the USA done with the NSF Center for Biotonic. And this is visualizing HIV transfer between two cells. So this is what I thought was a mind blowing video, right? So. The hard thing about this experiment wasn't the optics, and they're, they're actually doing with optical traps. This is another experiment where they want to look at viral exchange, okay? And synapse creation between two, two cells. So this is obviously why this is a, an amazing example of what we can now do. And the biggest challenge here was actually labeling the virus with DFP. So it was, a, it was really a chemistry, biochemistry problem. But you can see here, the cell taken off. So they actually moved on to doing SIM studies. This video is quite old now, or not quite old, but it's six, seven years. So I think they're currently working using super resolution to understand exactly how that synapse and communication channel forms. So that's a nice example of where you use optical trapping and you might need super resolution. Okay? So there you go, that's, that cell's infected. Now, of course, infection is a huge topic on many levels, so you can see why this would be very exciting and important to a lot of people at the single cell level. Anyway, resolution. So we've heard about this equation already. Who's been to Yale and seen this? Oh, you, might. you guys need to get out more. Right, so <laughs> on the main road in Yale, where Zeiss is, you've got this. And on there, you've got the equation. So if, you, if, you, if it's near the planetary, I don't know what, I can't remember the name of the road, but it's... Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's the equation that we all know. So this is the equation that Colin was putting up this morning. It's lambda over 2 NA. Okay? And as was commented this morning, really what we're doing is we're modifying that equation a little bit. So uh, I guess Stefan, I think I'll bet see we haven't sort of spray painted it yet, but I'll put a square root of, well, I think it's 1 plus I, I over IS. So there's a kind of non-linear, something else that goes on the bottom to, to modify it depending on what you see. So, there are a lot of methods. We heard about STED this morning, um, and we heard about um, SIM and other things. But what I wanted to do was just give you more physical intuition into the into super resolution, perhaps, and just show you a little bit about how SIM works. And many of you may know about SIM, and we heard this morning the ISM method that Colin had, had, was republished in Physical Review Letters on a, a principle that he taught with a pixel reassignment. Okay. So these are the main methods at the moment. I'm not saying any of them are, are the best or winning, but they're very, very important. And they're challenging the way we think about how this, this equation works and what we can actually see. Um, so what I'm going to do is just say, where, where, where do these ideas come from? And this is what super resolution, this isn't um, my, pic, um, my picture. This is from a lab in Oxford, and I've forgotten to put the citation. But this is the kind of three color sim picture you can take. So I've already put this slide up. But, so, just like my airy beam slide, the first thing you need to think about is it is really loss of spatial frequencies. Okay? We have a spatial frequency window when we collect light through an optic that we are constrained by. Okay? So, why did, and Colin mentioned this, but it might have been a little bit subtle for some of you, I don't know. Why did he mention that near field was okay could be the diffraction limit? Anybody there? Yeah, I think he mentioned it a few times in his lecture. You can ask if you want to. But does, <laughs> right. it have, does it have something to do with evanescence? Yeah, so but it's basically because what we're doing is we're collecting the light in the near field and we're, we're cheating because we, we, we're only using it in 2D. Right? So it's 3D capturing in the far field that we need to do. In 2D, we don't need to worry. We've got the third dimension, we can throw information out infinitely. So that, Colin mentioned that a few times, but I noticed that everybody kind of accepted that this morning. But that's a very subtle and important point in terms of the physics. Okay, well, we can't all work in any of We can't just always do turn, all right, for example, or total internal reflection. We need to work in the far field. 
And in far field, what happens is, there's a, if you think of spatial frequencies, then case space, some of them decay away, and our lens doesn't capture everything. So we're limited to some 2NA over lambda. So what we have is that spatial frequencies define our object. Okay? So for example, if I take these pictures of these uh, two penguins who are uh, socially having a little chat, if, for example, with the high frequencies taken out, in other words, the silhouette, the sharp outline of the penguins, of course I pick up the sort of global features here, that's fine. But if I pick out low frequencies, remember I'm still in my 2MA over lambda space, I, if I pick out just the high frequencies, I see a different picture. I see very much the, the sharp features of this, this penguin rather than things like its coat or something that's slowly varying over time. All right? So every person is, we're all spatial frequencies. If you're wearing, if I was wearing a stripy shirt, someone in the front row might be able to tell the picture of that shirt at the back, you might not. Okay? And that's what we're capturing. We're capturing spatial frequencies. And the secret is, how do we capture more of them so that our effective um, 2NA over lambda term goes up to, what, well, either infinite, like stead, or does, does something else. Okay? So, um, I thought we might know the Marilyn Monroe. So this is this doesn't always work. So this is a um, this is Marilyn Monroe. Now this is a famous thing. So if you if you, if you can get on the internet, um, have a look. Uh, just type in Marilyn Monroe and Albert Einstein. This is a composite picture. It doesn't quite work, but I've made it a bit smaller there. So what happens is this picture is a composite picture of high frequencies from Albert Einstein's face combined with low frequencies from Marilyn Monroe's face. So what happens? is people in the front should see Albert Einstein, but this room's not big enough. But if you're further away, you would see Marilyn Monroe, it's just like the penguins. So, okay, so we're capturing the high frequencies of one person and the low frequencies of another, and we're superposing them. How was this done? It was done like this. So whether this, um, this website here, New Scientist, is tells us that frequencies dictate what we see. So what you see with your eyes, it's an illusion. It's dictated by the numerical aperture, and wavelength and so forth. So here what somebody did was they put a low frequency filter on Marilyn Monroe, high frequency filter like the penguins on Albert Einstein and added them together. All right? So have a, have a, have a go at that. Well, sometimes you can do it if you just hold your hand up in front of you and then reduce your NA. I don't know if that works as well. Sometimes you can do that. Everybody should try that. I'm trying it. Maybe it doesn't work. It might work at the back. Does anybody see Marilyn Monroe? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. Okay, so you're reducing your NA, and that's reducing your NA over lambda term. That's it. It's simple, right? Amazing, right? So just try it. Just hold your hand up and just uh, be reducing it. <laughs> so there's a quick way of doing it. So that's it. You're doing spatial frequency filtering in real time. Okay. <laughs> So it's, it's cool, it's fun, but please remember the physics. The physics is these spatial frequencies that we're trying to capture. So let me just say a little bit about SIM, and these are, um, and this is, this is also, I'm not trying to hypnotize you now, but what we're trying to do here, just give you the idea of how SIM works. <coughs> so that's really it. Take a piece of nylon, fold it over itself, and just move it over. That's essentially what SIM is. And Colin mentioned this in passing, moiré fringes, there they are. You see those big fringes there? Right? They're pretty easy to see, yeah? If you had to guess, you could probably, if I put a scale on the side, you could probably tell me the picture of those fringes, couldn't you? Now imagine that the piece of nylon underneath is in my biological sample and... Oh, is that the end of my computer? Let's see what's happening. All right? Let's say the, the image underneath is a frequency in my sample. Okay? It doesn't matter what it is. On top, I put another frequency. And I measure with my camera the moiré fringe pattern. That's easy, right? So now what do I have? I have a known pattern I put on, I have a big pattern I can see, and I have an unknown frequency in my sample. Right? And I have no slides. Okay, so that's funny for that. Right? Okay. So how does that work? So has everybody got the idea? You can go, you can see this effect. If you're sitting on a train, I know probably everybody came by bus, I maybe out a bus window, you see railings passing over each other. See that effect? See it with cloth? See, lots of lots of play. Look out for it. It's a lot in you can see a lot in nature, this moire fringing effect. And that's exactly what sim is. Alright, so more specifically, how does sim arise? So what we do is by putting on that grating, what we do is we shift with the moire pattern the case space. Okay, so there we go. We shift the case space over there in one direction. But remember, the, the pattern was rotating. Why are we doing that? We're rotating it because in this diagram of kx and ky, 
If I just put on the panel in one direction, I just shift that circle of 2N over lambda in one direction. What I'd really like to do is do that. But I can't do that if I have the pattern just going on like that. I need to rotate the pattern so my circle rotates around the center. Okay? So that's essentially what SIM does. Okay? So I'm just, I'll, I'll, I'll skip the text and show you some. So here's um, some simple videos. Uh, slides. So this is a structured illumination. Um, this is an example of a grating, right? So there's a grating. And a grating binary would give me two spots. Everybody happy with that, right? It's not blazed or anything. It's just two spots in my case space. Now, let's imagine that I'm taking an inset picture of an insect and I have spatial frequency. So there's my blurry picture, just like the Marilyn Monroe picture or the low frequency picture of the penguins. I have low frequency information. My case space is small, right? My 2N over lambda is small. And I may have a little bit of information, but I want to go out here in detail. So what can I do? I could use a high numerical aperture optic. If I do, let's say I've used a 1.4 NA, all right, to multiply that at 2, divide by whatever wavelength is this, 500 nanometers, I define my circle in case space. Okay, that's my case space window. Now what do we do? Now we illuminate with this periodicity. Remember, what was it? It was two spots, right? So what's it going to do? It's going to be multiplying in the Fourier space, it's going to shift the circle out. There we go. Now, Colin said, oh, um, mentioned quickly this morning, you only get a factor of two. Why do we only get a factor of two? Any ideas? <coughs> Getting late in the day. Okay. Because, the, yeah? You, you can move it further away than your numer numer numerical aperture allows. So the center of, um, yeah. so you, you have to, you have to image the, the pattern. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely spot on. So the answer is, it's because you can't cheat up with these. You've got to put the pattern through the same bridge, same optics that you started with that you're looking through. So the biggest pattern you can put on is to get 2N over lambda. So we can only get a shift equal to the size of this circle. And that's why you have to rotate. Now there's tricks to do how you do this. Okay, so people rotate this. And that's why it's, um, the commercial sim takes six pictures or so. And they fill in the gaps and take, make that a bigger circle. And then if you do that, you can get an NA equivalent to 2.3 or 4. Okay? And, and you do this for the particular wavelengths or for um, the range of? No, I think you do it for each wavelength, actually. And so here's another example. This is a gate. And so Colin put this up, I think, something similar this morning. We have a lone illumination function. And then if we use Fourier maths, we can actually recover basically the um, f of g, what we want, what you want to do. So we can resolve that principle, resolve what we can get. Um, I'll just end by what uh, maybe with uh, something we've done in SIM. It's a coincidental, another group looked at another disease. So we, we set up a SIM microscope because I like the lower phototoxicity, it's quite simple. Um, we're developing a compact SIM at the moment as well, in the group. Um, and with colleagues at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York, in the Bronx, they, they've got, uh, it's a long way to go, but it's very useful because they've got a pathologist who really believes in our work and is spending an hour or two uh, a day with us when we're there, which is a huge amount of time. So they've got specific diseases. You know, medicine is very local. It's, you know, when you go around the world, you find sort of, you know, life expectancy can change from town to town, place to place. And they've got their own set of diseases. And kidney disease is a big issue there in that part of New York. And kidney disease uh, relates to the glomerulus, and the glomerulus filters your blood to urine, and your protein levels can um, be elevated if that's not working properly. And kidney disease is very, very high due to either drug abuse or other um, abuse in, in certain parts of the US. And this is very, very high. So they were basically looking at new structures inside kidney tissue. And so when they were doing this, what they would normally do is they would actually stain some tissue and take some pictures, and they also went to an electron microscope to take some images. And electron microscopy operates at virtually near vacuum levels, and it took them about a week to take the pictures. So um, they, sent, they sent us um, 
it's, it's in this paper here, but so I won't go into a huge amount of detail. They, they actually prepared a lot of fixed samples for us to look at from patients, and we ran through a lot of samples, and we, even though it's now SIM, only gets down to about a factor of two, so it gets to about 100 nanometers. I, need, I should point out, again, Eric Betzig's group has published a very nice paper on non-linear SIM and turf SIM. So by combining near field and SIM, they've got down to about 80 nanometers, and also by using non-linear SIM, which introduces harmonics into that equation, that I put up earlier, they can get down to about 40 nanometers, which is very exciting, and that was um, last year. But here we're sticking to about, we're getting about 80 nanometers or so. And what the, the pathologist was able to do was correlate, even though they're not as high resolution as some of the electron micrographs, the pictures on our SIM microscope with the electron microscope. The beautiful thing for us, and this is another interesting challenge, is as you develop technology, how are you going to retrain a clinician to interpret your instrumentation and data? That's hard. We took again the easy route here. What we did was we just color coded the picture to look like the picture he was trained to look at under the electron microscope. So you could immediately just put both side by side, say, oh yeah, I think this is. So we did a lot, um, quite, a, quite, a, quite a nice little study there. And this is going to send us um, some more samples that we're going to maybe place an instrument there to do a much larger clinical trial in the next year. But that's a simple example of how super resolution microscopy could change studying kidney disease from a week to a day. <laughs> Which means they can look at more samples. Okay, I think I will stop and give everybody a break. Um, so I hope in the last four hours <laughs> um, you've learned a little bit about complex beam shaping in space and time, and um, you've enjoyed um, some of the outcomes. So thank you for your kind attention. That's appreciated. So um, I don't know if we have any other questions for Kishan. I think it's been quite interactive, which is great. And uh, I'm around all week as well. Mainly due to Kishan's uh, excellent uh, interaction with you. So thanks so much for that. Uh, as Kishan says, um, he and most of the lecturers will be around uh, all of the week. So uh, there's good opportunity then to interact. Uh, socially and often it's in those informal interactions that you can uh, solve problems so uh, if you uh, uh, if you have the time to buy a cup of coffee or something for these guys they might solve the, <laughs> the, the main problem between you and uh, submitting your PhD trying to move on from the, from the discussion about whiskey <laughs> Far too many references to that, and uh, those books are far too close to here. So, uh, without further ado, I think we should adjourn to dinner, which will be uh, in the main room where we had breakfast this morning. Okay. And by the way, breakfast tomorrow morning will be a buffet style, uh, so hopefully it will be much more efficient than it was this morning, and uh, hopefully we don't have other people coming. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.